All right, everybody. So this is um, Monday, January 11th, 2021. And although this is the first class of the new year, first quarter, it is actually class 13 in the series of Buddhist Negong, uh, which is a internal um, Qigong practice. And basically in the last uh, semester, I guess, so to speak, the last ongo of the first 12 classes, we went from basically a standing static posture. And we saw uh, in pre-preliminaries, uh, just the physical structure of standing. And then we began to work with um, guiding the energies through the body in a certain way, being grounded, being centered, being rooted. Um, and then we uh, started getting into uh, working with the breath. And we talked about five gates breathing. And we talked about the contractive inhale and the expansive inhale and breathing throughout the entire body. Uh, and there's some other stuff we got to in there, but generally that's a kind of a broad arc of what we covered in the first 12 weeks. Now, the material um, that we're gonna get to today is gonna start moving it further. Um, before I go there though, if anybody has any lingering questions or any objects of clarification uh, that they'd like about that material, we can try to address them. Although, before no one's hand went up. Let's see, Shokai, she's pondered her question, please. So did I understand that with the chi packing or the guardian chi, mm -hmm. you can use either expansive or contractive breathing? Yeah, that's right. I mean, in, in, guardian chi is anything that you do that brings the energy out of the body, right? And it's basically like setting up a perimeter. Um, so I can, um, Basically, if I do a contractive inhale and draw the chi in, and then on the exhale, send it around, then I've made this expansive uh, energy happen with a contractive beginning and an expansive exhale. I can do the same thing the other way though. I can do an expansive inhale where this is expanding as I draw in, and then as I exhale, let it go out. Um, it's a little bit easier, I think, to do a contractive inhale and an expansive exhale to have the feeling. I think it's more intuitive that way. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you can move the chi independently of the breath. So it's important to not tether the two permanently. You don't always have to breathe any particular way. You can move the chi uh, just with your mind quite readily, uh, eventually. But to get there, we tether it to the breath as sort of like an easy way in to kind of get the feeling of it. So if you're trying to get a sense of guardian chi, I recommend a contractive inhale, store it, and then bring it out on the exhale. And this is easier for you to feel what you're doing in, out. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. Nice. Okay, so let's move into the next topic. And this is, you know, first structural stability and then grounding, centering, sinking, rooting, fine. And then we get to breathing uh, so that we understand how to fill the entire body. And it's basically pulsing is what I would say. You're drawing in and sending out, drawing in and sending out this kind of thing. Now we're on our way to uh, the Bodhidharma series. That's what I'm trying to build us up to. Um, there's one piece yet before we can get there, okay? And that is called circulation. There's small circulation and there's grand or large circulation. And so up to now, what we've done is simply um, breathe the chi in and out kind of like that and fill the body with chi. And that's, that's awesome. The next step is to take the chi in the body and actually begin to circulate it along uh, beneficial pathways, okay? So I'm gonna open this window here for a second. So um, the first one is called small circulation, okay? And uh, the small circulation It is just using the spine and the front of the body. And so basically it just kind of goes through the back and the front of the body and the torso and the head. 
grand circulation begins to use the arms and the legs. And so we're not going to address that right now. Right now, we're just talking about small circulation. And to understand it properly, uh, there's just, uh, you, you know, a few terms you kind of have to have clear, okay? One of them is a thing called the governing vessel. And this is a technical term that you should familiarize yourself with. The governing vessel uh, is basically the spine, okay? And it starts from the tailbone, the very tip of the tailbone, and goes all the way up uh, to about the third eye. Some teachers will say up to where the eyeballs are. Some people will say up to where the third eye is, but somewhere along there, all of that is what's called the governing vessel. And it's very important to understand that in Chinese medicine, um, basically the spine and the nervous system is the center of everything. All organs uh, attach to the spine and relate to the spine. Uh, the spine is sort of the command and control system uh, that relates to the brain, obviously enough. Um, so the governing vessel, okay? Now there's another vessel uh, equally as important, a so named conception vessel. And the conception vessel goes from where the governing vessel ends and connects it. So it goes from, let's say, for our purposes, the middle eye here, and it goes down the front of the skull. Uh, if the tongue is forward on the roof of the mouth, it goes down here and goes down the front of the body and swoops around to where the tailbone meets it. So if you imagine, um, you know, a torso, you've got basically, if you make a circle around the torso, like if I'm sitting here and I've got a circle around me uh, going this way, it's in two halves. Uh, there's the governing vessel from the tailbone uh, beneath the sits bones up the back to this point, And then there's the conception vessel, which goes down the front and meets it. And it just circles around like this, okay? Governing vessel conception vessel, okay? Um, now these are distinct from other vessels. Uh, there, there are others, for example, the water, um, uh, th there's, other, there's other vessels, we'll just leave it there for now. These are the two main ones that you need to be focusing on for this. This is sort of like the big guns practice. Um, you know, there are many, many, many vessels and meridians and uh, distributary uh, places where the chi moves through the body. And these governing and conception vessel is kind of like the big guns. And the idea is that once you learn to get the posture straight and learn how to cultivate chi in the hara and distribute it to the uh, internals and out to the conception vessel and for the uh, guardian chi in like a general way, what we want to do now is start to take that chi and cycle it through the body in ways that are very healthy. Okay. So um, there's a there's a pathway called the fire path, and for those who uh, you know foolishly went ahead and got get this got this book thinking it would help, uh, here you may be vindicated somewhat. If you turn to page eighty five, uh, let's see if I got that right. Yeah, 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 here we are. Okay, page 85, you have a, actually a helpful graphic. And I'll just put this right here uh, and hopefully you can see it, okay? And so this is a pathway of chi. And what you can see here is you've got a little dude, okay? And there's something drawn around here. Now, the way this is, it's gonna come from the tailbone up the, and it's very important, it's actually very important that you do this on the outside of the spine. Okay, it's like between the spine and the skin of your back. Okay, so uh, it's on the outside of the spine and it goes up here, right? And around the Bahui point and up to the third eye point. And then it goes down the front of the body to the conception vessel. And when the chi circulates along this path, that's what we call the fire path, okay? Down the front, up the back, or up the back, down the front. That's called the fire path, okay? Uh, yang path, okay? Um, now the water path is something that's distinct. And you, I would like you to be very clear about this. And this is actually very important. 
the water path goes up through the center of the spine and goes more into the center of the brain and then connects to the conception vessel and comes down. The only distinction between the two is the fire path is on the outside of the spine, between the spine and the skin, and the water path is up through the center of the spine and through the brain to the third eye. Okay, they both go down the conception vessel in front. There is a graphic of that uh, water path somewhere in this book. Yeah, that's on page 91. Probably difficult to see through the computer, but hopefully you can get some kind of sense. This, this here actually goes right up through the center of the spine, okay? And you guide it slightly differently. Now, why I'm pointing this out, okay, there are more internal workings that you can do to bring the chi up through the spine into the brain. This we call brainwashing. <laughs> but we're not, we're not getting to that just yet because it literally is washing the brain, okay? Like literally, like brain cleansing, you could say. You bring the chi through the brain and cleanse it. As I gave many cautions about this earlier in the course though, you don't want to bring chi up to the brain and have it just stay there. This is the most difficult, the most dangerous thing is stagnation. You do not want to have any stagnation chi anywhere around the brain. Okay. So right now, what we're doing is much safer. You don't, you don't go up through the center of the spine. You go through the back of the spine. So it's out along and it comes not through the center of the brain and in, but comes along the back of the skull and comes around. So this uh, grand or this small circulation rather using the fire path is very much between the skin and the bone, like between the skin of your skull and the bone of your skull, the skin of your head and the bone of your skull. It's traveling along on the outside of the body. Now, when it comes here, it goes straight down through and the cartilage of the bone is sort of ignored. It comes right down here. Your tongue is up on the roof of the mouth. It catches the tongue it goes straight through your impressive beard and comes right down here through the center line of the body. And here it's inside about that much right down the center line. And it comes through and catches uh, the tailbone, okay? Now, this is the primary um, cycling, okay? There's also, I think, what is it called, wind? The wind path is the inversion where it comes up the front and down the back. So you come up the governing vessel and down the fire vessel. This is, this is possible, okay? For those of us in Aikido, um, you know, one of the main ways that I'll off balance you is I'll send my energy up your, uh, up your wind path. <laughs> and that, that uproots and up balances a person, okay? Uh, but there are healthy versions of it. So the the conception vessel down the front of the body, can, the chi can go down or it can go up. And the uh, governing vessel in the back of the body, the chi can go down and the chi can go up. Either way, it can happen, okay? In a healthy body, it's going to go on all over the place. But specifically, small circulation is the practice of building chi in the hara, which we've been talking about extensively, and then taking that chi and cycling it through the fire path such that it rises on the inhale along the back and then sinks down the exhale down the front and continues in this way, okay? Now, um, the way that you do this, you can, um, again, like we were saying earlier, the easiest way to do this um, is in a seated meditation posture with your legs crossed. That's the easiest way. And if you, if you cross your legs in full lotus or half lotus or something like this, what ends up happening is that you shut the legs off and the chi will not go down to the legs. And this is when you're doing small circulation, preferable. You want to contain the chi. You don't want the chi to leak out in other ways. You're trying to make it go down this track, putting guide rails and guardrails up. So uh, in Zen, we always say there's no exoteric or esoteric significance to sitting cross-legged. It's simply a stable way to be in the body, and that's absolutely true. But that doesn't mean that there aren't esoteric uses for a cross-legged posture. There certainly are, and uh, this is one of them. So if I, if I cross the legs like this and I shut the chi off to both legs, it actually is helpful in the practice of small chi circulation. So these are meditational practices, 
Uh, they're not Zazen. Don't confuse it with Zazen. This is using something that looks very similar in posture, but it's a completely different uh, working, okay? This is specifically um, seated chi circulation practice, is what you would say, okay? So uh, for those of us studying Zen, uh, you know, when you sit in Zazen, it's a completely different game. Automatically, the chi starts to circulate in healthy ways when you do Zazen, however, uh, if you learn to cultivate chi and take your jiriki and move the chi through the body in specific ways, that is an incredibly empowering longevity practice that you will not get the benefit of if you don't consciously do it, okay? Therefore, uh, consider it as a separate activity from zazen, because it is, but it looks damn near the same. Uh, it really does. You know, it looks, you can't tell that. In fact, you could even use your hands in the cosmic mudra just fine while you do it if you wanted to. Usually, however, I recommend doing this literally with the hands uh, because this helps to feel it. So when I, when I do this practice, I'll sit with my legs crossed in whatever way I can or in a chair is fine, but really it is good to shut the legs off a little bit. And I'll use my hands to uh, lightly make circles like this. And I'm feeling the chi start from the tailbone and come up the back of the tailbone on the inhale, draw it up to the front and then exhale and bring it down the front. I'm sorry, it inhales up the back and down the front. The easiest way is with a contractive inhale and an expansive exhale. Now there's an important moment, like if you have a kid on a swing and they go here and then they go here, it's one momentum. It doesn't go like this and then that, and then this and then that. It goes here and then there and then here and then there. And you imagine the kid goes all the way around, right? It catches and then it comes down and catches. So there's this way that you're taking the chi and every time it comes down, you catch it and bring more chi up to the center and then it comes down and catch it. So when you inhale, it's a little quicker. It's like that. It's not a, it's a, it's you kind of, um, it's kind of like pushing the kid on the swing. They, they come up and you, you meet them and you give them a little push and then they have fun. They go, wee, and they come back and you meet them and you give them a little push, right? So the breath is like that. When I inhale, it's coming here and I go, and it's just as the chi meets the bottom of the tailbone, you kind of scoop it up and draw it up the outside of the back and then exhale down and then catch it and then down. Now you don't have to do this with your hands, but I find it very helpful. Okay, and eventually you can do it just with your thumbs or you can just do it lightly or you can just be still with your hands and do it entirely mentally. That's fine too, okay. Um, I first learned this personally from a um, Aiki internal power teacher named Dan Harden, uh, who is a, is a very powerful uh, practitioner of Aiki um, uh, power. Uh, I don't know how else to say it. I mean, his Aikido is an art that's based on the power of Aiki. And uh, I was at a seminar with him and uh, we were sitting there talking and we, the subject came up and um, he showed it to me personally um, and in, in the context, not so much of generating martial power, but in generating longevity and health. Okay. Again, if you switch to uh, Chinese or Asian, uh, Pan-Asian medical perspective, including Indic, uh, stagnation is a primary source of disease in the body. Getting the chi to circulate is a primary source of health in the body. Okay. So this business of circulating up the outside of the back of the spine to here and down the front is like the big guns primary uh, health longevity practice. So um, 
Any questions on this or shall we try it? A few, let's try it a few times and then see if some questions arise. So sit in some kind of a cross-legged posture if that's easy for you to do. And if that's not, it's okay, uh, but you know, something. Okay, now for this, um, when you practice, I recommend you have your eyes closed because again, what we're doing is we're trying to feel in the body, okay? In a very, very similar way to when we were scanning through the body and opening up blocks underneath and letting, bringing the chi down, you take that same jariki and bring the, uh, bring the energy through the body. So we start by drawing the energy in to the hara, do a contractive inhale, bring all the chi into the hara, and then bring it up the tailbone and use, it, use your fingers like this with me. Draw it up your back. You feel it scan up, up the back. It's up the neck, it's at the top of the head, third eye, and then exhale down down the front and then catch it inhale up draws up the back hits the third eye exhale let it fall down inhale bring it up exhale down inhale up Exhale, just go ahead and do this at your own pace for a while. One more breath here. Good, and then release. <laughs> okay, so comments, observations, questions, or poetry. Mark, yes. I'm finding that when I do that little catch breath at the bottom, mm -hmm. you go up again. My, my tendency is to uh, almost do like a gasp, like, and then sort of force it up with my mind. It sh I should be continuing that breath. Up well, what happens, uh, it's, di there, there's not just one way. Okay. You could do a slow, I'm making it audible. You could do it like that, okay? Um, what I find though is it's not here, it's not, it's, and it's low. It's like, it sinks to here and then it continues to draw. So the chi is still coming in and being siphoned up the back, but I'm not going the whole time. Okay, but you are yeah. continuing to breathe to no. no, okay. okay, not really what I do. What I mean, I can like I demonstrated an early right. response to your thing, you can you may if it's uncomfortable to do what I'm doing, that's fine. But what I what my what my practice does right now is I go. When it comes down the front, it kind of crests over here, 
and then it, it falls like water. It comes over here in like a waterfall whoosh, and gets to the bottom and goes. It's exactly like that in my in mind. Now, but when I inhale, it's not up here. It's low. And you can do like a quick inhale and then lightly inhale through the nose. It's just drawing, but then you take that energy that you're drawing in through the body, through all, you know, basically all of the body is drawing in and you're channeling it up through this uh, governing vessel as you do. And then it gets here and then, whoosh, then it falls down. You don't want to hyperventilate. All right. There are breath practices that are really ass kicking and strenuous. And this is not one of them. Okay, there are like athleticisms of the breath and they do very interesting things. I mean, you can put yourself into quite a state. I've done it <laughs> and this is not that. Okay, this should feel comfortable in the body. It's not an endurance thing. It's not like working out. It's an attentional thing uh, using the breath to circulate. Does that help? Good, okay, anybody else? Juka, yeah. So I think that my question is um, maybe the same question that you just answered. But yeah. when you're um, describing that low drawing, what I experience is that uh, um, I'm the quick drawing in of air going around the tailbone. Mm -hmm. And then it's like I'm holding my breath mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel like drawing. And so. Yeah, well, the air stops coming in the lungs, mm -hmm. but the, the draw up the spine continues. Okay. So it's possible to inhale the whole time. Like I said, maybe that's an easier way to do it for folks. If you go in and go. And just do in and out the whole time. That's fine. I find that very tiring. I find it much easier to just go. And when I go, the air stops coming in, but the sense of suction and drawing in and guiding it up the spine continues. And I'm definitely body scanning through the body, you know, like, um, yeah, I'm coming here I'm coming in and then it slows a little bit here up the back of the spine this is my head hi like that okay Thank you. Yeah. You know, again, if we were in person, I would I would do this on you and you can feel it or let you put your hands on me and you can feel it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's a little funny. I need puppets or something. So on, yeah. So the in-breath, uh, breathe through your mouth? No. Well, let me think about that. No, what you want to do with the inhale, I'm doing so you can hear it. It's actually, that's a really good question. I'm breathing in through the nose. And then out, you know, you can do it either way, but I'm exhaling a little bit with an open mouth. You can do that entirely through the nose and be, it's a gentle thing. It's not husky. It's not like doing a bunch of push-ups or chin-ups or something like that, okay? But it is generally better to draw in through the nose. You can draw in through the mouth, like I did literally, but it's it's less aggressive. And eventually what we wanna do, you, you have to be a little bit young when you start because you're trying to forge a new path and it's alien to you. So you have to kind of be a little bit aggressive to get there. But then to really do it, you have to let go of the aggression and it becomes yin and you just kind of let it happen. 
right? Uh, it's a it's a classic challenge in learning that when it's really new, you need yang energy to forge your way in there. But integration is always yin. You have to let go of such effort or else you're forever uh, cumbersome to yourself, see? So inhaling, exhaling, it should be gentle. You could easily do this on a rocking chair with a cup of tea and a cat and just very gently sit there and just enjoy it and just circulate the body through, uh, circulate the chi through the body. It doesn't have to look like some kind of a qigong push up or something, but probably it has to be a little husky for a first, I don't know, 10 hours or so of doing it so that you actually know what you're doing. <laughs> you can actually feel it. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Uh, Kelly, yeah. I'm not good with Zoom, sorry. Um, I have to breathe pretty fast because of my lung capacity being low. I don't feel like I have like enough time before I need to take another breath of air. Like I really couldn't feel any chi at all because I was so concentrated on am I not getting enough air. So if I do it at my breathing pace that I need, I can't, scan, I, like I, I'm not skilled enough to scan anything in my body at the same time. Does it matter how fast you're doing this? Um, no, I mean, I get you, you can do it faster, but what I would recommend you do is that you break it up uh, into a couple of um, sections, if that's the case. So you can go in from say your belly button, your, your one point era. Let's see, how would I do this? It takes me about three breaths to do it at the pace you were doing when you were guiding it. You can break it up in a way that makes sense to you. You don't have to like cram it into being forced. What you're trying okay. to do is you're trying to get the ball to roll. All right. And so if you go like say in, out, in, out, in, out, okay. in, out, that's fine too. You okay. know, the, the main thing ultimately is you don't have to like fuck around with your breath at all. You can actually just sit here and go like this, like I'm doing it right now as I'm talking okay. and I'm breathing and the, and the circulate, the chi is going exactly where I'm pointing with my hands and I can feel it and I don't have to sink it to my breath in the least. Okay. okay. So ultimately it's not always connected to the breath. It's something you do with your mind. But for this to be more than just finger wagging, it's helpful to connect it to the breath. So the breath is an upaya, it's an expedient means. It's not forever, but it's always easier with the breath until it's not. Thank you. And this, by the way, you know, uh, what we do in next week's class is talk about grand circulation, which is taking the chi and bringing it to certain points on the body. And then, uh, you know, Reiki, I mean, uh, you can take the chi and send it outside of your body. And you can do this for medicinal healing effect, uh, for blessing and empowerment, and you can do it for martial effect. Um, Aikido, the art that I'm most versed in, um, uses this regularly as a way of generating power. Uh, you know, but if you can't um, cycle it through your own body reliably, then we need to start there. But um, if you had to breathe in sequence with your attacker, your technique would never work because they never, <laughs> everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? So, um, <laughs> or what's the other quote? No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. I think that's a classic uh, also phrase, I think from Shun Tzu. Uh, so Mike Tyson and Shin Tzu, two great martial minds of, the, of, of our humanity. Um, but anyway, the point is, it can't, it, it, it must not always be tethered to the breath. It may be, it's always strong when you do, but it's definitely required in the beginning. If people try to do this without using the breath, they'll never find it. It's not going to happen. Unless they're a very, very strong meditator or they've got incredibly strong uh, uh, perceptions of their own body, like maybe, I don't know. I've never met anybody like that though. Does it make sense? Yeah, thank you. Good question, yeah. 
Um, Jesse, please. Um, so what do we do if we encounter, um, as, as we're going through, if we encounter, um, like with the other practices we've done, like on um, sort of blockages and stuff, do we want to take a moment to try to open those up like usual? Yeah, exactly. Okay. If you get to a place where there's insensitivity, like numbness, you can't feel it, or there's pain or difficulty, go back to the earlier practices, stand and just ground everything through the body. Remember, if there's a pain somewhere, you, you go to the pain, you, you contact it, you go underneath it, you open up the floor and you draw it down, right? You can go in there and open it up and draw it down. You basically work with the body to get all the blockages grounded into the earth energy while your spine is up to the heavens. And when you do that, once you've got yourself grounded, then then the next thing we do is draw some chi into the hara, and then now we start to circulate it, okay? Now, there are also minor blockages that you can blow right through just by doing the circulation. You know, sometimes that's also true. But the great uh, opening of the energy lines is sinking down. Doom, 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 doom. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So when, when uh, people who uh, know this stuff talk about it, what they say is you want to fill the governing vessel with chi and you want to fill uh, the conception vessel with chi. Right, it's like a battery that you're storing, or a, a river that you're bringing more water to. Maybe that's even a better. That's a better example. You want the river to be full. This means not stagnant, but the, there's a lot of water in it, and it's swishing around. And you want to get these really so that there's a sense of fullness in these uh, vessels, so-called, in the body. And that's uh, it's not stagnant by definition. It's uh, circulatory, right? But by bringing your mind to it, remember we said very early on in these teachings, it's mind uh, and then chi and then body, you know, where you put your mind, the chi accumulates and then the body follows along, right? So if I put my mind and I scan along those points, the chi will start to be drawn there and circulate just the way when the moon moves, the waters of the ocean are pulled towards it. It's exactly like that. So it's like you're drawing the energy around the body in that way. Let's see. So, uh, any other questions or observations on this one? Mark, yeah? So I'm just curious, in a typical uh, day in the life of Jay. <laughs> I'm, I'm a complete pain in the ass. <laughs> <That is fine. laughs> yeah i'm unbearable really it's true but is this something a practice and, and other things we've been doing are these practices that you would do every morning or several times throughout the day or if it's a stressful day maybe uh, a little more frequently yeah i mean The thing that's most relevant to ask is like what it would be useful for you to do. That's like the most relevant question. For me, I've been playing with this stuff for a really long time. And so they're like old friends of mine and we hang out kind of as needed. Mm -hmm. So they're, uh, how do I, how do I make this? I know it's like, like learning to improvise jazz music. Okay. When you're starting to learn a certain technique or something, it's not familiar. So say like Coltrane's uh, tetratonic patterns or something, that's a topic. Okay. And when you don't know what that is and you start trying to learn it, it's very, it takes a young, it's aggressive. You have to work on it all the time. It might take half a year at least maybe a year or two before an improviser will spontaneously use that technique in their music. But that same artist a decade or two hence, it's just part of their stream of consciousness vocabulary. It'll just come out as they hear it, right? So these things to me are like that uh, personally. So I, I, what I know I always do is every day, 
before I even get out of bed, when I start to wake up, I start, I just check in with my body and feel where the energy is and make sure things are circulating well and stretch a little bit and feel. And I haven't even opened my eyes yet, really, but I'm starting to just kind of come back to the day. And if I feel something a little out of line or a little out of whack, I kind of do in the bed kind of Qigong stuff. And then I come to sitting and I'll sit there for a minute and I'm just lightly doing this very casually, but I'm, I'm kind of scanning and making sure, you know, uh, the, the feet hit the woolly slippers and on goes the robe and off I go. And then, so it's kind of integrated through the day. Um, but I do on most days have at least about an hour where I'm actually just doing practice. Like uh, uh, someone who lifts weights will go and just, you know, hit the hit pumping iron for an hour a day or whatever they do. You know what I'm saying? So that's where I do new stuff. So I might have a new thing that I'm working on. Uh, that's a separate thing. That's a new item, a new study, right? There's reviewing old stuff. And then there's, um, you know, having a routine that's helpful. You know, I tend to hang everything of late off the eight brocades. Uh, I'll warm up to them. I'll do them. I'll do stuff after them. And I'll use those eight brocade and the two meridian stretches as sort of like the baseline thing that stuff hangs around, um, which is kind of unhelpful because we haven't talked about them in this class yet, but we're getting there. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> what I would recommend you to do um, is to make sure you're in touch with the early practices that we've done. And I think it's super in everybody's interest to consider themselves to be a Nagong practitioner and to have a daily um, checking in with it. You know, even if it's, uh, I don't care how much time it is, but you know, some amount, like it's like a daily practice. I expect my Zen students to be engaging in Zazen, right? And I would expect my uh, Nagong students to be engaging in Nagong, right? Uh, and so it's a, it's a topic of study. You ultimately, what you wanna do is have a repertoire of moves that you can use to help yourself feel great. And you can, you can self-diagnose and you can apply intuitively uh, kind of in the moment, but you've got a, a, a structured program that you're kind of working with as a framework for that. So I would recommend, you know, something like, I don't know, 20 minutes to an hour a day. And you have kind of a routine, hopefully where you start standing and you always start with the standing and the alignments and, and then uh, drop through the body and then start to bring the uh, chi in and circulate the uh, guardian chi and then maybe circulate a little bit like this. You can do this standing. Uh, it's easier to do sitting because otherwise the chi will want to go down the legs. And from there, you can just move into Dr. Lu's eight or uh, his 10 uh, energy movements, he calls them, you know. And, uh, and then when you get done with all that, just stand there and let the energy circulate through the body and you crushed it, you know. And then you might say, okay, I'll study um, this new topic whatever part seems interesting and give it a couple of minutes, just kind of work on it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Does that make sense? Very much, very much so, yeah. When I was young, I really wanted my teachers to tell me exactly what to do, like how many sets, how many reps, exactly how much weight, what body part. I mean, to, to pick a bodybuilding analogy, like I wanted the whole thing spelled out. And then the problem was um, I would never do it. <laughs> 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 and that was a big problem or the problem was i did it exactly and rigidly like correctly every time and then that was a problem too i found out that actually it's just an unhelpful thing honestly you know what what, what is useful i think is to um meaningfully and fluidly engage with guide rails and guidance that tends to work you know there are seasons to things um you know, like that standing posture. I mean, there was a season of that in my life where I just stood there. And that's all I was doing for a long time in my Qigong practice. I was just literally just standing, just checking it out, you know? So it was kind of a maniac phase. I wouldn't want to do that forever, uh, but it was great to do it for a while because now I have that feeling in my body and I can reference it. 
And when something's not lined up, I kind of have something to do with it. I know how to work with it now, see? Um, and I guess a last thought on this is that, you know, something that takes you a long time to forge is very easy to um, access and call forth once you've got it, if you maintain a connection to it lightly. If you forge it and then you forget about it and you don't engage with it again, a couple of years goes by and you've lost it. So it is important to keep track of what you've spent time on and don't let it just fade away. That's very demoralizing. You know, if you build some capacity in a certain way uh, and you put all that effort in, make sure you touch it uh, in some routine way so that you don't lose it. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I have had a few people ask, why don't I just lead classes uh, with this? And it's because I, I, I don't think it's, I, 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 I don't know how to do it. <laughs> okay, let's go. You know, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see, though. It gets much easier. I tell you what, though, just for, for reference, we have small circulation, and then next time we'll do grand circulation. And then we have all the tools in the toolbox to approach Bodhidharma. It's called Dhamma Wydon, uh, which is the closed fist static postures. It becomes much more concrete then. It's like, do this posture, do this posture, do that posture focus this way, focus that way, focus that way. Give me five breaths each. It becomes much more concrete at that point. There's the closed fist, there's the open palm. Those are two different sets. And then there are the moving forms, right? And uh, the eight brocades is one of the moving forms. So interestingly enough, the more advanced things are easier to start with because you can see them. <laughs> yeah, so we're working our way there. All right. Anything else? Shokai, please. So when I sit now, the chi is like part of my awareness. Yeah. So I just treat it exactly the same as I would any other sensation. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You're just more sensitive to your body. Imagine if you were um, hearing impaired let's say you had a, you, you had a 60% a hearing loss and you didn't know it. Let's say you didn't know. And so you're sitting in Zazen and you're used to hearing 40% of the sounds in the world, right? And then uh, lo and behold, uh, by algae or um, vitamin or a little scraping or something, suddenly you can hear 50%. You would hear more, you'd perceive more sound, okay? And maybe there's some exercises you do. You wiggle your ears like this and you make yourself be able to hear a little more. But then when you sit, it, treat them just the same as uh, when you could only hear 40% of the sounds. It's the same thing. You go into the same Zen practice doesn't change at all. You can just sense more, you can hear more now, right? Well, when you, when you do Qigong, it's like getting your hearing from like, you only hear 10% up to 100%. You can, I can feel the blood going through my body. I can feel the nervous system. I can feel, um, I can feel the cells sometimes in a really deep stillness. I mean, the whole, this body right here is a whole cosmos of activity. Um, and when I sit, you know, fuck it. I'm just sitting, that's it, just sit. It's the same as the sounds of the, the squirrels and the birds and the breeze and the zendo and the smells and I'm I'm sensing more, but I'm not uh, tethered to it anymore. See, does that make sense? It's very much the same thing in spiritual states when you, um, uh, how do I say this? There there are heightened states of awareness, uh, and zazen will absolutely give access to them, uh, and they're not the point. You don't want to sit there and make yourself uh, have some kind of intense spiritual orgasm all the time or something. Um, uh, it's not the point, okay? And so when you sit in zazen, um, let the chi in the body be what it is, right? And just stick to your practice, just sit, or just be with the koan, or just concentrate on the breath, right? 
Um, and yeah, if you start paying attention to the chi in the body and you develop a qigong practice, you're going to have a hell of a lot more sensitivity to the chi in your body, for sure. You're going to feel the magnetic pull of the earth beneath you. <laughs> You'll feel when the solstice hits, you know, and it's great. Uh, but don't get pulled around by that any more than you would get pulled away by some, you know, you know, when you slip into a really deep samadhi, it's quite exquisite, is it not? Uh, but it's not the point to hold that forever. So in the same way, does that make sense? Yeah, it's a really good question because a lot of um, a lot of people who who think they're doing spiritual practice really aren't, in my view. What they're doing is they're doing interesting energy work in the body, and they're 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 somehow tapping into some of this stuff in some way, but it won't lead to enlightenment or awakening. You can circulate circulate the chi in the body incredibly well and you will never have kensho doing it ever it won't happen uh you can you can make your guardian chi incredibly strong you can get martially deeply powerful uh you can use your chi to heal someone even to some degree or the next it won't lead to awakening and kensho uh so those are separate areas of endeavor however just in the same way that people come to awakening by hearing a shout or a thunderclap or a light being blown out or the sound of bamboo uh, from the broom, uh, you know, if you're in the realm of that stuff, some of those things might catalyze an awakening, but it could just as well happen from taking the trash out. Uh, and probably better for you if that's how it happens anyway. Does that make sense? All right. Okay, everybody. Well, um, you know, it's been a nice to take a couple of weeks off. Uh, and uh, boy, it was just a boring, uneventful, nothing in the news kind of few weeks. Uh, so it's nice to get back to have something to think about. <laughs> Actually, seriously, it's nice to be back and to connect. And uh, this will definitely press on. Uh, my intention is to keep doing this uh, through the, um, the spring semester. Uh, we've got our charts corded. I'd like to get there. We, I don't know, we might run out of content. We might not, we'll see, but my plan is to just keep this ongoing. So, um, I'll send out the links and we'll see you here next time. Meanwhile, let's have a dedication of merit, uh, Kaishin, if you would. We dedicate this merit, the merit of this time of, uh, study and our time together to all those beings all those people in the world who feel cut off from a sense of themselves and from the energy that can connect us all. May it be so. May it be so. All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your practice now. <laughs>